I want you. We're picking up in the 23rd chapter of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> and to recap just briefly, Abraham has just gone through a tremendous trial. And the nature of that child reveals the fact that there is a message. There is a sense of the purpose of God that's been conveyed from Adam's time all the way to the events that occur in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. <coughs> and that are supported by the events we found in the 15th chapter where a covenant is cut by God where he becomes the one that guarantees the promises to Abraham the promises of a nation that would become more numerous than the stars of the sky of the sands of the seashore And then in the 22nd chapter, God has decided in types and shadows to reinforce that notion of the necessity of the shedding of blood for the remission of sin and for the establishing and maintaining of the relationship between a separated creation and a holy and a righteous God. Abraham has been asked to take the one that was promised, the one that was miraculously born, Isaac, and to seemingly by the world's point of view put him at absolute risk so as to make the promise of God of non-effect. For things to be impossible. For all that was hoped for to be destroyed. And Abraham, knowing the story that had been passed forward about the shedding of blood, undoubtedly the promise of God concerning the one that would be the issue and the seed of the woman, steps up believing firmly that Isaac would be returned even though the commandment of God was to allow Isaac to be a sacrifice for his life to be taken on a hill uh, called Mount Moriah which we found was the place where Solomon's temple was built and on the hill overlooking that hill in a place that we've come to know in the New Testament as a place of a skull, Golgotha, also a place where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords tested and tried as we are is crucified between two thieves. And everything we found in the 22nd chapter was a type and a shadow of things to come. Abraham in faith looking forward to an execution on a hill that would forgive all men's sins forever by an exercise of grace through faith. Those that were Old Testament saints were made part of the household of faith looking forward to a cross. Those of us on this side are of the household of faith because we look back to a cross. At the central point is we all look back to one sacrifice, one shedding of blood, one act of ultimate love and grace for things past, and things present, and things future. Abraham, a man just like all of us, human being, 
filled with frailties, having made wrong decisions in his life, having recovered from those, having had to fall on his face before God and to worship him, to allow his grace to make changes in him. Abraham now faces in the 23rd chapter what I suggest to be a trial that's <coughs> even more difficult than having to take his own son. As we begin in the 23rd chapter, it says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of Sarah's life. Now, Sarah was 90 years old when she conceived Isaac. This entire business, and I didn't get to say this last week for time, this entire business of Isaac being the son of promise, being the one that was born at the right time, miraculously conceived, and not Ishmael, that was the son born by the contrivance of human effort. It's so significant, if you were to read the story as it's recorded in the Quran, the Quran says that it was Ishmael that was taken to the top of Mount Moriah. Yet, it also records later that Jesus was not crucified on the mount, but lived out his life just as a prophet. This central issue of salvation by faith through grace with no assistance on our part is extremely important. This entire business of believing God. One of the themes that came through clearly to me this week was the absolute importance of recognizing that it is the working of grace in a heart that changes people for the usefulness of God. One of the huge marks of maturity, of a readiness to be used of God, is when our thinking changes and when we come to the firm conclusion that our lives are no longer about us. My life is about Jesus. My life is about what God wants. And then as we heard the one song reflecting what we find in Jeremiah, where God makes it clear that his heart is to do good toward us. When we come to believe that, when we come to understand that the promises of God are yea and amen, that he never wishes evil toward us. We live in a world that's filled with evil things. We live in a world that's frightened and, and afraid that so many things may happen. We live in a world that tells us that we have to fight and scratch to build security. Because if you don't rely on yourself, no one else is going to look out for you. The Christian comes to understand that we have a God in whose hands is all things everything. And we are fortunate in that he means good toward us. You know, I've said before, you can't kill a dead man. If you're already died and buried with Christ, you'll rise with him again. What threat can you make against a, a person to take their life? You can't steal from somebody who doesn't own anything. It doesn't mean you live in poverty. 
It means that all things that God's given to your hand are given in stewardship, and they belong to him. He takes them and gives them as he pleases, and it makes no difference, because he means kindly toward us. His intention is to make a way. Sickness has no hold on us and should have no fear, because ultimately, every believer will be healed. Every believer will be healed. Whether it be on this side of glory, or if it be on the other side, makes no difference. We'll all be healed. We'll all be filled. We'll all be warned. And the promise is absolutely true. And there is no power so strong in the entire universe that it can stop it. It's done deal. Sarah sees the moving of God at 90, lives to 127. It's interesting to note that this is the only woman in the entire scripture for which God gives an age. God, guys, if God's bright enough not to talk about a woman's age, I think there's a message. <laughs> <clears throat> he did it to make a point, and then he never did it again and had never done it since. <laughs> I, just a little side point there this morning. So Sarah died at Kirjath, uh, uh, Arba, that is Hebron. The word Hebron in English means fellowship. Sarah died in fellowship with her husband. She died in fellowship with her God by faith. It's no accident that this place is called the place of fellowship where she went into eternity. I'd like you to turn with me real quick to the book of 1 Peter because Peter has something to say about Sarah and her relationship and her character. And that's 1 Peter, and we're going to begin in the first verse. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. And here, I think it's important to note that when God created Eve, he did it in a response to what he saw in Adam. The scripture says that God took a rib from Adam, from his side, near his heart. Not from his head that she should rule over and not from his feet that she should be trodden underfoot. But a healthy one alongside. And this relationship of submission is not a relationship as a slave. He brought her there to complete it. I find it interesting in Genesis as it describes the account that God looks on Adam and he says he sees his aloneness. He never talks to him about it. He sees that the condition exists. And in God's wisdom, he sets Adam to be about the work that God has for him, which is to take dominion over all the beasts of the garden and to name them. And then he causes a deep sleep to call on Adam to, to uh, fall on Adam. My sister-in-law at one point was <laughs> she she was. Uh, I want to say this properly. 
she 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 had a friend that she thought might become more. And I was joking with her one day and said, well, you know how God generally puts a man in a position where he's willing to get re get married? It starts with a deep sleep. <laughs> and so I told her I was going to pray that this fellow starts to get sleepy. <laughs> and we were standing together and uh, this gentleman was there and she was <laughs> there. And I just made the comment, I said, are you feeling tired? <laughs> and he had no idea what I was talking about. And he says, no, I'm just fine. And I said, my sister-in-law <laughs> standing there. And she just, I, if, dad, if, if looks could have killed, <laughs> I would have been headed for the tomb in Hebron. <laughs> and at any rate, I just, I laughed. And I said, oh, no, it's just a little joke. I said, I, I'll keep praying. So at any rate, <laughs> it goes on that even uh, if some do not obey the word, without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. I've told you before, and I want to tell you now that my wife is here, that a great many changes came to my life as a young man and as a not, not so young man because of the witness of my wife. There's some things that I have never heard come out of my wife's mouth. In 40 years of marriage, she has never said, I told you so. In 40 years of marriage, there are as many things that have come to me to change me by what she did not say as what she said. I can't count the number of times in hard times when friends and the remainder of the world walked out that my wife has walked in. And to read it again, wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, not the wife, the husband, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Women, you enjoy a position that men will never have. It is possible for a woman to stand with her husband when he is wrong and for her to be completely right. To watch a husband disciplined by God and to stand with them and to be in right standing with God when your husband is not. Because the part is to be a help me and the task is to help, not to make your husband right. Because in doing so, you heap coals of fire on the men in your life. And for those of us who have a heart before God and His grace is working in us, it humbles us. Would you agree with that, guys? Absolutely. <laughs> Second verse. And when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the, the hair, wearing of gold, and putting on fine apparel. I'm reminded of what it says in Proverbs. It says that a beautiful woman who has that brash, run-the-mouth, unwise attitude and speech is a lot like a pig with a gold ring in its nose. No matter how beautiful the ring, it's still a pig. And a godly woman 
has adornment that no jewelry store can match. That's the point here. It's not talking about makeup. It's not talking about how you cut your hair. It's not talking about the makeup you choose to, to wear. As Adrian Rogers says, if the barn needs paint, paint it. <laughs> it's not talking about those things. It's talking about that beauty that comes within. Hey right, guys, I'm sure you'll agree with me at this too. You can tell a godly woman, woman within a very short time of being around her. And there is something that is truly beautiful about a godly woman. There's something there that can't be matched by the, scan, the most scantily clad, supposedly beautiful woman in the world. It's just hollow. It's not enough. Fourth verse. Rather, let it be the hidden <coughs> person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. God honors the woman of a gentle spirit. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God and adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now what are they talking about? I don't recall my wife ever calling me Lord. And nor do I think it would be a good idea. But I can tell you <coughs> that in her attitude toward me. I have heard that many times. And at times, it has caused me to fear for my decisions, to consider her and my children and the things that affect them because it humbled me. And you notice the admonition that's given by Peter that says the woman without fear. No fear of the loss of a lack of identity. I had a, I had a good friend, he and his wife, good Baptist folks. And I remember standing in their kitchen in tears because they were considering a divorce. And I looked at them and I said, don't do this thing. And at any rate, there are two principal reasons, a top two on the list, I guess, of reasons that people divorce. The number one is over money. And the second is over uh, sexual relationships and what doesn't doesn't happen and their issues were both and you'll find in time that I try to be appropriate but at times I can be fairly blunt never with a heart to damage but sometimes I think that there are things that are so important, they just have to be said. And in the privacy of a conversation with these two folks, we address those issues. And his wife made a comment. She said, I just don't want to lose my own personal sense of identity. And what she was saying and didn't realize it was, I have fear that being in submission to my husband, being willing 
to be a part of his life in that way, I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. Eve, when she was approached by the serpent, standing by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the thing that Lucifer said to her was, what God has said to you is suspect. It's not true. God knows in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you will be as God. In other words, you better watch out for yourself because his heart and intentions are not completely good towards you. Things don't change very much. And that's exactly what the enemy was saying to him. This instruction of the Lord about your relationship with your husband. <clears throat> He's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. You better stick up for yourself. We were all standing in their kitchen and all three of us were in tears. And I felt like I delivered the word hugged them both, walked away, and now I still talk to them both in different parts of the country. Now, the seventh verse is written to us guys, and here's what it says. Husbands likewise Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. That word that's used for dwell means <clears throat> live with your wife. Be part of her life. When I was a younger man, one of my first jobs was as a deputy sheriff for a large metropolitan sheriff's office. And I worked more overtime than I could shake a stick at. I thought I was doing the right thing because I was making a life for us. You know, my tent making job is I'm a nursing home administrator and I've been with more families that were there at the death of loved ones, husbands for wives, wives for husbands, children for parents. And I've seen people mourn in different ways at the death of family members. Some so, some so hard-hearted that children standing in the hallway outside of a room where a parent is eminently going to die, fighting over the scraps of their worldly possessions. I've been in places with genuine believers where they certainly mourn. But they came not to say goodbye, but I'll see you soon. And I've been in places with those who mourned so deeply that they were torn bitterly inside. And it went on for days and weeks and Months and sometimes until they grieve themselves to death. And in that circumstance, there was one common denominator guilt. This one seemingly innocuous statement, husbands likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Never met anybody on a deathbed 
that said, I am so glad that I worked all that extra overtime and gave up the time with my kids. I never met anybody who said, you know, I feel much better that I didn't say that silly, mushy stuff to my wife. But I have been with a great number of people that would trade every day from the day of that funeral for one chance to say what never got said. The one chance to take the weekend and just go. My wife and I, the night before we got married, I would never have recommended and have never counseled anybody to do some of the things we did before we got married. First off, we only went together two weeks. I would never say that to somebody I was counseling. Number two, the way I proposed to my wife was to say, I, when I got, when I really turned my life over to good folks, <coughs> I was positively great. I mean, everything changed, it seemed that way. Looking back, I had so many rough edges. You, you had to put on gloves to pick me up. And at any rate, I, but I was determined that I was going to give God control in my life. And my proposal to my wife was, I can't marry you unless God really speaks to me. <laughs> Boy, is that romantic or what? <laughs> and we spent the night before in a city park in North Portland, swinging on the swings. And we've gone back and done that since, albeit not at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Some things do change. But looking back, the things that I regret in my life, I regret that I don't have more pictures of my children when they were small. I regret the times when I've had to be away from my wife and not present to share her life. And I would encourage everyone, if there are those who are important in your life, to whom you've left something unsaid, go and say it. Don't leave things unsaid. Husbands, Dwell with your wife. Say the things that need to be said. Be present in the moment. Walk in when the world walks out of the world. Be the one person that she can count on, whether it be to speak the truth when it isn't going to be popular, but always with love and by the example of our Father, always leaving no doubt that what you say and what you do is unquestionably with the heart to do good to her. Peter speaks of Sarah as a woman worthy of such things. And he gives us an insight that she conceived by faith. Ninety years old, all the odds against her, likely no one else who's ever experienced this. Abraham believed God, sure enough, but when it came down to it, the realization of the promise came because of a woman who believed God. I'll bet that's really tough on people who don't like women involved in ministry. Take a look, if you would, at Hebrews, the 11th chapter.
Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and we're going to look at the 11th verse. Paul echoes the same sentiment concerning the way she can see. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child. And when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. The promise came by Sarah's faith. What a twist, huh? We like to talk about Abraham and his faith and his life. When it came right down to it, the best man for a job was a woman. Don't hear this one preach much, do we? All right. Back to the 23rd chapter. Zero lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kiraj Arba, that is Hebron. Sarah died in fellowship, their husband and her God, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Psalms 57 talks about there being a bottle and God collecting tears that we shed in that bottle. If you go to Israel today, there are curio shops where they sell bottles where people used to keep their tears in those bottles. It's the notion from Psalms 57 that God is mindful and that there's something special about being in tears. When I came to understand this, one of the changes it made in my life as a young man is an understanding that whoever it was that said real men don't cry had no idea what they were talking about. Men that are not humbled and moved on by the spirit of almighty God to such a degree that it brings tears are men that are in desperate need of encounters with the Spirit of God. That's a reality. There are those that mistakenly have the idea at the passing of a loved one that if they were really believers, that they should be absolutely convinced to the degree that they would be, they will be resurrected from the dead, that there would be no tear and no sorrow. Abraham was a real man. And it says here that when she died, he made sure that she was in the land that God had given them. Their land. And he wept bitterly for her. You don't live with somebody for that length of time. And they don't become the most significant <coughs> part of your life in human relationships. Then Abraham stood up from before his dead, and he spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place from among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now this is significant. It speaks to Abraham's mindset in this entire deal. When the issues were there with Abraham and Lot, Lot decides to go to the green grass. Abraham goes the other direction. Lot eventually becomes involved in the entire <laughs> political life of Sodom, gets sucked in, becomes one of the elders at the gate, and loses all influence with them. We had covered that. Abraham, on the other hand, has the promise of God that the very land in which he stands belongs to him. No one has a claim on this property. One of the claims of those who we call the Palestinian, which for the most part are actually disenfranchised Jordanians, their claim is that they were in that land before Abraham ever got there. 
Now, they want to claim him for Ishmael to be the one on the altar. But they want to claim that, uh, that they were there first. So any ancestral claim is theirs, not Abraham. Abraham knowing that God said, this is your spot. And I've made a promise. And that promise is guaranteed by the fact I walked between the plagues of pieces. May this be to me if this is, doesn't happen. And what was he <clears throat> promised? That there would be descendants that were more numerous than the stars of the sky and the sands of, of the seashore. And we are told, Paul tells us clearly, that it's those of us that are of the household of faith that are grafted in and are a part of that. Gentiles who believe God along with Jews who look forward to the cross. All of us. And he knows of a surety that this property is his. He knows one other thing. After he pours out his heart, weeping over the loss of Sarah, he speaks to them and he says, I need a place where I can bury her out of my son. In other words, all this is mine, but you can't steal from a man who owns it. It all belongs to God. I am. This promise is secure by his covenant. The story goes on. He, he is going to bury her out of his sight because he has caught the vision of the fact that his life doesn't belong to him. He can't kill a dead man. And it's not about him. It's about the purposes and plans of God. And because it's about the purposes and plans of God, he knows that he has to mourn for Sarah. He has to bury her and then stand up and be about the purpose of God. It's about him, not it. This man's thinking has been adjusted, seriously adjusted. Fifth verse. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Remember? Abraham lived simply. Abraham chose to live in a tent. Abraham chose to live separated. Abraham chose to stand up for the mutual good, not in compromise, but in partnership to accomplish a greater good for all the people. No compromise, but a willingness to be in partnership for those things that did not violate his faith and the instruction of God to his life. And they respected him, and as a result, they listened to him when he spoke. Remember? These are the same people, same people, that were living in the area around where Sodom was destroyed. These were not great people. These were the people who did not have a single concern for the God of Abraham. These are the people who did not embrace anything that Abraham embraced. But because Abraham was steadfast and refused to participate in things that he knew was wrong, not even under the guise of compromise, when he did speak up, they listened. They saw the depth of the emotion and the commitment to Sarah in his heart. And what was their response? Hear us, O my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in, in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. He had impact on them because of his stand. 
separated, but not aloof. Not offensive, but not a compromiser. Not unwilling to cooperate for the common good if it didn't violate the principles he knew that God stood for. Then Abraham, seventh verse, stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land and of, 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 of Heth. Do you see this? Abraham doesn't get in anybody's face. He actually humbles himself and bows, between these, bows before these people knowing who they are. You can't humiliate a man who's already humbled before God. There are people that hold their relationship with God as a banner to do war. They are spring-loaded to attack in a pharisaical way. Abraham didn't talk about their sexual proclivities. Abraham didn't become involved with the wrongness of their politics. Abraham would not compromise. But even though they had honored him in that way, he would not be out humble. And he bowed before the sons of Heth, he first, and he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and meet with Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is at the end of, the, of this field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for the burial place among you. Now Ephraim uh, dwelt among the sons of Heth. He was there. And Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gate of the city, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you, bury your dead. Look what's happening here. It says, Abraham wants a cave. They've already offered him the best of the hewn sepulchers built in a manner that gave honor to their gods. Two things are significant in Abraham's response, in his request. Number one, I don't want anything that you built according to that which honors something I can't agree with. Number two, I want the cave at Machpelah. Machpelah means two doors. This is a cave with a way in and a way out because she will not stay in the earth. Ah! Abraham knew that if he put her in that cave built by God, not hewn with the hands of men, a place that's done by the grace of God, not by the work of the hands of men. That there was a way in for her, but she was coming out. The resurrection was sure. First Thessalonians, and in the fourth chapter, Paul tells those at the church of Thessalonians that all of us who sleep in faith, all of us who are believers, and it doesn't make a difference if you're looking forward to the cross or if you're looking back. All of us who believe God, it is guaranteed we will see each other again. We will raise from the dead. Now something I find interesting is what I think is a lack of understanding with a great many Christians. The scripture tells us plainly that a day is coming when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We who are of the household of faith aren't going to sit on a cloud for eternity. 
God is going to repair this busted earth, destroy it, build a brand spanking new one, and all of history is going to get a chance to fade away and we're going back to where it went wrong on earth. And we are going to have this earth. Abraham was promised a piece of ground. And he wanted Sarah buried in a place that was going to be there, as the scripture says, forever. That was his spot. How many Christians bear unnecessary pain and consternation because they don't have a handle on what God has delivered to them in his promises and haven't planted their feet and their resolve and said, this is my spot. This is what he gave me. And I'm not here. And the advantage to us that it doesn't rely on our strength, it relies on his. He holds us. I'm fond of telling people, we don't hold God, he holds us. His thoughts are kindly to us. He puts us in divine situations like felicitous, where others might not even be impressed with us until the day comes when we stand and make our quiet, fleeting state, and even if our voice shakes. And the impact is huge. It goes on. Tenth verse. Now Ephraim dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of his of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gate of the city, saying, that means the leadership, he's saying this, among those who could solidify a contract. No, my Lord, hearly, I give you the field and the cave that's in it, I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you to bury your dead. And then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land. And he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. Now, I want to point something out. And earlier, before we started, we had a discussion about this business of how the scripture does or does not touch on the Patriot Movement. Abraham was speaking before those at the city gate, the leadership. And he makes a statement here, even though he knows this land belongs to him. He says, I have no desire to take a benefit from the leadership of this country. He says, as you look at his life, his life says, I have lived frugally. I've chosen to dwell in a tent instead of building a great city. God has blessed me as I've lived simply and I know where I stand with my God. All I'm asking from you is to step out of the way. I'll pay my own way and do it where there are no strings attached and I don't owe you. He didn't have to make a compromise with people who were not interested in the ways of God. I believe it was Thomas Jefferson that said, when a people come to the place where they realize in their democracy they're capable of voting themselves benefits from the treasury, that it's the end of the republic. Abraham would have none. 
what God delivered to his hand is what he truly owned. God had made a way for him to pay for that day, and he wanted no relationship that brought dreams with the government. Wow. Who knew God was a libertarian? <laughs> And Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Seth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. Here's what happened. If you go to the Middle East today and you go to the inner markets where people trade, who are natives of the area, it is not uncommon to have this scenario play out where you go to a particular shop in the market and you say, how much is this item or that item? And they say, oh, for you, it's a gift. The proper response is to say, oh, you're so gracious and so kind. No, no, let, 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 let me pay for it. And the answer, oh, no, I mean, I mean, it's worth X number of dollars. Generally, that's where the haggling starts. And there's this sense that they probably ask four times what it's worth. But no, no, it's worth that, but you take that. Oh, no, at least allow me to do something, okay? But let, let, let me give you a hundred for it. Well, if you insist, that's the way the negotiations happen. Abraham here wants to make a point that he wants no concession from the leadership. And he says, 400 shekels of silver, of silver done. Pay you what you've asked. No strings. I owe you nothing. One of the few places in the Bible where we really know where it's at. We know where the Temple Mount is. We know where Golgotha is. We know where Solomon's Temple, by and large, but in a few yards of where it's built. We also know where the cave of Machpelah and Hebron is. It was originally covered over by a Christian church and was taken over by the Muslims. And today there exists a mosque there. They still allow Gentiles into their mosque because it's a revenue source. But you can go to that place and there over the tomb of Rebecca, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, uh, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, they're all buried there. They're buried in the place of fellowship with God. They're buried in the place of faith with a door in and a door out. And you can look down into the inner cave and you can see the place uh, uh, where they, Jacob actually was mummified in Egypt and carried back. So his body may still be there, the rest are probably disintegrated into dust. But at any rate, that land still exists. We know that it's there. We know that they are, that they are buried there. And we also know whether there's a mosque over the top of that or not. It will be Abraham's. And it will be forever. And our king, Lord Jesus will sit on David's throne and it will be forever. Abraham had the sense of things that were bigger and better that were coming. He declared himself to be a pilgrim and a sojourner, even though he knew he owned it all, that God had given it to his hand. He recognized that he was looking, as the scripture says, Abraham was looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. 
everything we live in right now today, all of it is going to burn. It's all going to be destroyed. But it's all going to be rebuilt. We are all going to have our place. I'm going to have a garden with no wheat. The promises are yea and amen. And they're to us. No matter what happens. No matter what the struggle between here and there. Nothing will change the faithfulness of God toward us. And it only comes one way. Because we believe.